TPN at technophilespodcast.com. I'm David Geisler, and this is the Technophiles Podcast. I really think these companies are trying to um, acquire a customer that was previously or maybe in the future would not be in this space. In this episode, Leona speaks to David about using robo-advisors to make personal investments. Hello, everybody. I am David Geisler, host of the Technophiles podcast. And tonight I am very excited because we are joined by a new cast member. Uh, She is Leona Liu, Skyping in from Chicago. Leona, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? (laughs) <laughs> I'm well as well. Thank you for asking. Now, Leona, I'm, I'm actually really quite excited because anybody who's been listening to our show for a long time mm-hmm. is aware that we have, um, as, as the years have passed, our format has kind of ebbed and flowed and we've had to switch it up here and there. Mm-hmm. And this season, it's we're doing a very, very different thing where we're doing just single two-person episodes and people are Skyping in and it's because our cast, as I've said so many times to our audience already this season, Mm -hmm. our cast has kind of exploded all over the country. And it gave me an opportunity, though, to bring in some old cast members, as I've also already said on other episodes this season. However, one thing that's very, very exciting is it's now I'm realizing it's also giving us an opportunity to bring in new cast members. And you're our first, so so welcome to Technophiles. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I'm very very excited because another thing that's happening this season, if I may, I'm, I mean, you've I think you've listened, if I think you've probably listened to the, the whole season so far <laughs> yep. of season ten. Is that about right? Yeah. All right, excellent. Because we've been chatting for a week here or so mm-hmm. about how you'll be coming on to the show. So anyway. Um, you might have noticed that a lot of our cast members this season kind of have specialties. You know, Alex loves talking about code. Uh, Jake loves talking about space. He loves talking about cars. Mm-hmm. I mean, we'll mix things up here and there and talk about different things, but everybody does kind of have their specialty. Right. I'm not exactly sure what your specialty is going to be yet, but I have an inclination of what it might be, okay. though I don't want to pigeonhole you. But tonight, our topic is something that we have really never talked about on Technophiles before. Okay. And part of the reason of bringing new cast members in, part of the reason I'm so excited about that, is that I want to also broaden some of the categories and topics that we speak about that still fit in the realm of science and technology. So if I may, that was quite a long intro, and if I may, I will ask you to kind of set up for our audience uh, what we'll be speaking about tonight. Sure. So today we're talking about how robo-advisors are changing the finance industry. Indeed, indeed. And micro investing as well. Now, yes. this is also, you know, again, uh, as I speak with the rest of our cast, there are times where I might be speaking with Alex and he and I know exactly what we're talking about and we're really riffing and we're really going or whatever and it's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. But then there's times where maybe Jake will bring some story and I won't know anything about it as the host of the show. Right. Tonight, I'm actually excited. I think I'm going to learn something tonight. Okay. <laughs> So, um, you, we were setting you up to be on the show for the past couple weeks, mm-hmm. and about a week ago, you messaged me on Slack and said, this is what I think I want to talk about. Right. May I ask, before we really dive in here, um, what made you feel that this would be something that you wanted to kind of discuss on the show? Sure. So, while we were discussing about topics, potential topics on Slack, I was kind of doing my own personal research. Uh, just for myself in terms of um, personal investments and finance. And I came across this term robo-advisor and I had never heard this term before. So I thought it would be something interesting to learn a little more about and um, share with our, or with the listeners. Yeah. Oh, it's our listeners now. You're in the cast, like (laughs) it or not. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. (laughs) It is our listeners now. Um, Yeah, robo-advisors. And it's so funny because even just two episodes ago, I just learned about this term called cobots, Mm -hmm. and and that was robotics expressed in a physical way. I suspect that robo-advisors are versions of algorithms and software that runs, but I don't want to jump, you know, I don't want to bury the lead or jump to the lead Mm -hmm. or whatever the expression, the appropriate expression is. Um... May I ask then, since this is what you'd like to talk about, sure. you, you have some very comprehensive notes here. Why don't we just kind of dive in and maybe you can uh, get get us rolling here. Sure. So robo-advisors, from what I've found and researched, is um, a platform that uses um, a variety of algorithms and each, each company and each platform has their own set of algorithms. 
And they use um, a variety of inputs, usually gathered in the form of surveys, to provide consumers with financial advice on um, which funds to invest in, what they should do with like the next $5,000, et cetera. And the goal is really to reduce the cost um, of a financial advisor. So there's Mm -hmm. very little to, so there's low to moderate human interaction with a robo-advisor. Is the idea there that it just becomes more efficient? It's it costs less because you're paying less for a human to do this. The mm-hmm. computer, the computer or the robot or the algorithm can do it faster and compile data more. Is that the general idea? Yeah, that's the general idea. Um, and so, what you can do instead of sitting down with a financial advisor, and usually you have to chit chat, do some small talk and whatnot. So the consumer benefits as well. Um, what they can do is just cut, kind of cut straight to the chase of like, this is my 30 year plan, or this is my 10 year plan. And these are my inputs. These are my goals. And what are my options? And so that was part of me, I, I maybe misheard. That's what a human would typically do? Or is this is what they are now able to do with the robo advisor? This is what they're now able to do with the robo advisor. So it's faster, it's usually faster um, than with a financial advisor, because you don't actually have to I go see. in. Um, oh, because back your... back in ancient times, in yes, the olden days, in the olden you go days. in and have to sit down with a human. You actually and... have to go somewhere. <laughs> Interesting. Well, I, I'm sure that yeah. as we talk about this more and more, we'll compare and contrast how the robo advisors are more efficient, perhaps, but maybe mm-hmm. there's a human element that's important as well. So, um, so let's let's keep moving here. Sure. Yeah. So traditionally. Um, kind of to start getting into investments, there's kind of a barrier of entry. Um, Usually you have to prepare a lot of documents and there's a lot of paperwork. And in order to purchase, let's say a traditional fund, a lot of times there's a minimum cost. And so for the consumer, it's a very tedious, boring, and maybe expensive process because there's a lot of transaction fees and so what robo-advisors are doing is they're kind of cutting through all of those things that have kind of um, maybe previously deterred consumers to enter mm-hmm. the market. And they're really making it so much easier for the consumer. They can just do it on their phone. There's very little paperwork. And um, there's just a variety of benefits to the consumer depending on their values. So this this sometimes is as simple as having an app running in the background Mm -hmm. and you're clicking a couple buttons. Yep. And a lot of them Hmm. now are just apps that you download on your phone. And um, it's very it's very simple. So right now, consumers are kind of moving towards and are more used to interacting with companies that have really great and a clean interface. So companies that are moving into the space need to be at that level to attract consumers because we're already used to that level of really easy interface and um, like nice it's it has good graphic design and it's it's ha- takes very complex ideas and breaks them down into very simple ideas sure. so a lot of apps now are doing that and that's attracting yeah. a lot of consumers I just thought about this. Is it? I'm just kind of playing around here. Is it? Is there a risk of it being too easy? Could people be irresponsible with their money because they, they're just clicking buttons and it's not that much different than playing Castle Crush or whatever, you know? Um, yeah, I suppose you could be irresponsible with investing um, in that you maybe save too much. But the benefit is as long as you don't put it in a 401k or um, a fund where you can't access it, there's really no immediate downside to saving more because you can always just access it if you need the funds. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah fair enough. Mm-hmm. It's like cutting a log. You can always cut it shorter, but you can't <laughs> cut it longer. Right, right. Yeah, it's still there and it's still yours. Um, so I see yeah. you have some demographic notes here too. This is kind of interesting. Oh, sure. Yeah. So a lot of companies or some companies are um, not only providing the service in terms of having a robo-advisor, but they're coupling it with Um, and what one company calls it as value investing or it's impact investing. And they're doing this because um, a lot of research out there has been finding out that millennials are 
more risk averse um, in terms of how they spend their money. But when they do spend money, they want to do it with a company that is um, ethical, has sustainable business practices, and has a pro-social message. And so one of the companies um, that I had listed, Open Invest, they're actually providing an upfront selection of values. So you can choose to invest in, let's say you want to battle, help battle deforestation in your goal of investing as well, or maybe hmm. you're against big tobacco, or you want to help reduce carbon emissions, you can use that as um, the companies that you choose as part of your portfolio. So um, they're really identifying with that specific market. Um, and um, if yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, 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 sorry. I'm and, sorry. And I kind of saw this. Um, I was on Twitter earlier this week. And um, even from the unfortunate events in in Florida with the shooting, a lot of people were going online and posting about these companies support these companies. And so until they make a change, we're let's boycott them. So th- there is a movement um, where consumers are being more aware just because there's more information online about that's, you can you track know, this a lot easier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're absolutely right. As you were speaking here, when I when I accidentally almost interrupted you just a few seconds ago, I was thinking to myself, boy, you know, I'm actually, I actually think this is a great idea. If I were to invest money, I'd like it to go towards something that I would support, right. not, not be cold and heartless and have no soul and have it, you know, go towards <laughs> something that I would be ashamed, right. you know, but, but, oh, maybe you'd make a million dollars, whatever. That's, that oh, a probably million is still dollars, very, you know, oh, million, whatever. <laughs> right, of course. Um, um, and I was thinking, well, geez, okay, this is cool, mm-hmm. but is it just marketing as well as I was thinking? And let's hold on that idea for just a second here, mm-hmm. because then as you were speaking about this incident in Florida, I realized, oh, do you know what? I don't know if it is marketing. I think that these younger demographics or 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 maybe just the the world in general mm-hmm. is more informed because of the internet because of technology yeah. and that does make them more interested you know there was um i remember watching movies in the 90s for mm-hmm. example and and characters and and not and not with a sense of humor characters in some of these films would say like do you even know what that company does? You know, yep. um, there's a couple sci-fi films that I think about, like Primer was one where these gentlemen were tra- time traveling back and forth and they were investing in companies and they were just saying like, you don't even know what they do. <laughs> and it was like early internet, 1993 kind of internet okay. or whatever. And I realized now, you know, fine, maybe they could have Googled and searched a million things um, in 1993. But now this is just this has permeated our culture. This is part of the the natural conversation is being aware of some of these things. So if I may, maybe it's not marketing. I kind of answering my own question, but I just wanted to offer that. I think it's I think it's part marketing because it's great. It's great PR um, to be able to like say, for example, this company Open Invest. The, in terms of investing, the, the algorithms and the funds and the entire processes on, on the second half is more traditional. But on the front end, with the user, it feels very fresh and new because you are oh. able to start off with these value selections. So part of it is... Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah, so part of it is great marketing or great PR for them um, where they're kind of able to come to the headlines when a variety of topics come up like, hey, if, you know, you're against this topic, then you should, you know, invest with us because we'll help to, um, you know, look at your funds and re-index them based on your values. Um, So I think part of it is they're going to where the market is moving to anyways, but another part of it is it's just, it's great PR for them. I can't help but think of services, and I'm serious about this, services like Apple Music and Google Play Music, mm-hmm. and I'll just use Apple Music as an example. When you actually do subscribe to the Apple Music service, the uh-huh. first thing that happens when the app pop up pops up is a bunch of bubbles come up and it says, select the music you like. There's a lot of services that kind of use this okay. thing. You know, oh, we're going to figure out your preferences, by you, you're going to click on rock and roll, and you're going to click on hip hop, and you're going to click on... I don't know, like anything, you know, okay. uh, actual artists. I almost said some artists and I was going to embarrass myself. So I decided to keep on moving. <laughs> okay. But um, 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 the, the thing is, the 
interpretation is that Apple is building an algorithm for your preferences. And that is yes. true to some degree. But what it's really doing is that it's making the user active in those first 30, 40 seconds of using the app. Yeah. It's teaching them to make choices, easy choices, emotional choices. Mm -hmm. So instead of just opening up the app and someone being like, okay, wait, what do I do? How do I do music? You know? <laughs> How do um, I do music? <laughs> right? How right? does this work? Yes. What, yeah. <laughs> so they're, they're starting to train them. Touch these things and we're going to be, you're going to be thinking about your music. You're going to be thinking about your liking. You're going to be touching the screen to engage. Right. This isn't that dissimilar. It isn't. And the interface, um, if you go into the app, um, it's very clean. So it just has a very simple. So for example, I have one of them where it says, um, divest from the corporations driving deforestation. And it just has a very simple graphic. And it's just very clean. Um, the idea is very straightforward. So it's not confusing at all. Um, and the great thing is they have about a dozen. So Open Invest has about a dozen different uh, value, um, I guess, categories that you can select from. Right. And the great thing is they don't limit you in the number of categories you want to support. So if cool. you are, so they, if they have 12 that you can choose from, you can say, I support all of these. And so all of your investments will not include anything that is against your values. Even if That's it's 12 different ones, they'll figure out a way to make it work. So we, we're seeing six here in an asset that you've provided. Mm -hmm. I've got it up and I'm seeing interesting things. There's there's kind of a thumbs up and a thumbs down experience here with these with these investments. Mm -hmm. They're giving you option to, yes, you want to invest or you are uh, you'd prefer not to invest in that category right. as well. Right. That's interesting. I didn't anticipate that. Yep. Cool. Well, it actually I see if I may. I've been saying that a lot this episode. I apologize. I'm just trying. <laughs> I don't want to be. I want to make sure that you're saying what yeah, you no, want no, to fine. speak about, but I can't help but notice that you have a couple other companies marked here. Would you oh, like to sure. talk about them yeah, more? Sure. Would, that, would that be appropriate? So another one that is helping consumers um, enter the investment space, um, because sometimes it is daunting, like, where do I start? How, you know, do I start with a savings fund? Do I start with um, a mutual fund? Do I start with stock? There's a variety of ways to start. So it, for the investor, it can be a little daunting. And sometimes to yeah. purchase stocks, you have to um, buy an entire share. Mm. And when you, when you purchase an entire share or a group of, let's say, 500 shares, you pay a transaction cost um, or a trading fee. Okay. Um, and so this company, Beanstalks, what it's doing is it's encouraging investors to start with small amounts. So say if you want to start investing in stocks with $5 a week or $5 a month, you can do that. And just for, get that ball rolling. Yeah, just get the ball rolling. It's not intimidating. And it's easier, I think, to put away... To start off with, okay, I'm just going to put away $5 or I'm just going to put away $10. It's not mm -hmm. a big, okay, I have to save up $2,000 to buy X number of shares yeah. of, you know, whichever company. And maybe, maybe, you know, for an early investor, a lot of times um, there's so many key indicators for how a stock is going to perform. Um, and so Beanstalk's actually a allows you to invest, let's say, 5 or $10 in a variety of shares. And they do this by, um, so there is a monthly fee, which there isn't if you do a traditional form of investing. So there's a monthly fee, but the, the transaction cost is lower. So it's easier for someone to kind of get in a good habit of investing. I don't want to be a pessimist, but you don't suppose they're actually trying to prey on people that are too scared to invest, but still pay the fee, but not t take the plunge? Um. I think that if you sign up, is, yeah, yeah. I don't think they're. I don't think they're trying to take advantage. Um, I yeah. really think these companies are trying to um, acquire a customer that was previously, or maybe in the future, would not be in this space. So they oh, want okay. to encourage. Um, what they're doing is they they they're trying to acquire these new customers and expand their market of investors. Um, yeah. And even with a lot of um, millennials, I'll say, when they graduate from college or when they enter the workforce, I think this group or this generation is experiencing higher amounts of debt. Um, 
And maybe, isn't this the isn't this generation the first to actually have more debt than the previous? Isn't that right. are we peaking a little I bit? I think I think I did read something where it did mention that, and and that is really delaying a lot of investments for millennials. Mm. It's not that they don't want to. It's just when the student loans hit or all of these financial, um, like large financial things hit, it's hard mm-hmm. for them to put away enough um, to do the traditional investment route. So these yeah. are kind of, these kind of investments such as Beanstalks is trying to say, hey, it's okay. Like we understand it's really difficult, but you can start with a small amount. Um, that's a very good point too. Maybe maybe that monthly fee is just to set to to fulfill all of the extra moving, pushing and moving, mm-hmm. figuratively speaking, that has to happen. It's like you could take one smooth glass of lemonade, or you have to take a million little. Like, which one's more refreshing? Which one takes more energy? All the little drinks. But you go, oh no, I'm drinking less lemonade just a million times. Um, right. Um, and maybe there is a small fee for all those extra teeny tiny little cups, metaphorically speaking. Right. And <laughs> and also one more metaphor. I'm, I'm so sorry, but I couldn't help but think about this. I was thinking about Beanstalks as you were talking, and I was like, oh, I like this a lot. It's It reminds me of, and I'm not joking right now. Okay. Uh, when you're a kid and you're building a snowman, and like that first little snowball you're building, every little ounce of snow is precious you know and and sometimes it falls off and you don't want to lose that snow and it doesn't pack quite right Right. and you're rolling it and it breaks in half and you got to put it back together and you're rolling it and you're rolling it but you know 20 minutes later you're practically kicking this thing down a hill and it's and it's a firm you know basketball sized ball of snow or sometimes even larger right and that and that i think actually is kind of a fair metaphor for money in the beginning every little piece is precious in the beginning yep and that's actually a great um analogy for how investments work over time, um, sure. it's, it's, you know, it, it grows, the more time you have to allow your money to grow, it kind of mm-hmm. does snowball, like, like how you were saying. Um, so these type of, the, 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 this micro investing really allows you to start sooner, even if it's a small amount, um, it'll grow over time. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, an, cool. so another one is Elevest and this also uses um, algorithms, and they also advertise of, as having a robo advisor. This mm-hmm. one is a female. Um, it's a startup um, run by a couple of women, and they're actually targeting the female demographic in terms of investments. So, um, what they're trying to do is say like our algorithms, whether it's true or not, I'm not sure of what the back end looks like, but in terms of marketing, they're saying our algorithms are built for a woman's lifestyle, um, a woman's income and life cycle. Um, okay. So a lot of times when when women start investing, they're because of this pay gap that that they are, um, that they have on their, that they were mentioning on their website, because of the pay gap, in order yeah. to catch up, um, let's say thirty years down the road, women actually need to invest greater amounts up front. So their robo advisors are using this kind of um, thought process in their algorithms. So, so their robo advisors, from what I understand, are going to encourage women to invest more up front, so that they can kind of um defeat this pay gap over with time in other words maybe it's more conservative in areas but perhaps the algorithm is more aggressive in other areas Mm -hmm. to kind of compensate yeah that's cool that's interesting right um Hmm. and then another one which is more traditional it's kind of like lfs but um it's for um i'd say it's for the more traditional um uh investor but also it's targeting millennials because on their website, they have all these videos of young people saying how great it is and how fun it is. <laughs> and so there you can, it's very clear who they're targeting. These, are these videos like filled with music and bokeh effect and everything else? Or is it mostly just happy people? I mean, everyone's very excited about investing and it seems like they like probably take two vacations to, I don't know, uh, Europe, you know, and, and uh, mm-hmm. whatnot. So, Got it. So they're really trying to up the energy um, in terms of um, in terms of investing, and all of these type of robo investors 
or uh, robo advisors they their cell is even though it's using algorithms it's very personalized so the surveys that i've taken for some robo advisors it's very specific it's very goal specific so say you want to buy a house um and you start with they always ask about your salary and then where you expect um your salary to be or what your annual increase is and they use these numbers to project out an entire plan for you. Okay. Um, and because of they're using robo advisors, there's it's just low fees. So this is really attractive to um, a lot of consumers. And on and the final company that Yeah, yeah, I think if you're a young kid, you don't have a lot of money, you're the last thing you want to see is a bunch of fees. Right. Fees are really a deterrent for a lot of investors. Um, mm -hmm. because it's really hey, hitting oh. yeah. Yeah, pardon me. Yeah. Why are the fees there? I mean, we know why, but why are the fees there? Traditionally? Yeah. Traditionally, the fees are there because you have to pay someone to manage uh, that account or to manage the funds or to, you know, when the market is changing, to change the indexes, but so, or to change the actual f um, stocks or the the allocation of, of um, the investments. But now with all these algorithms, there's actually a move towards index funds also, which is which is more automated. So mm -hmm. fees are actually becoming a really big topic in terms of um, fintech and just in the financial industry as a whole. There's kind of a fight to whoever has the lowest fee is going to win the customer. Well, yeah, I think so. I think mm -hmm. I can see that because the implication is automation and technology. Right. L uh, lower fees. Right. Exactly. And I think the yeah. consumer knows that they're like, they're going to ask the same question you just asked. When am I paying? What are these fees for? Right. Right. Everyone wants to kind of break down the. Well, and also, the, you know, people, people that are younger than certainly than I have been raised in a culture where, you know, if you've, if you've come out of the 80s or the 90s, there's a little bit of this tone to the culture of like fake fees. You know, yes. we see that permeate our culture all the time. And I also think that that is true. There's a lot of fake fees out there. Yes. We see it often still. So for a company to offer lower fees, it makes them appear a little bit more transparent. It makes them feel a more, more efficient. And I could see how that's attractive. Right. Be besides the bottom line. Right. And I think um, with a lot of younger consumers, not just for younger consumers, but when you want to understand a company's values, you want the company to be transparent. And so when you start this conversation um, or this thought process of how transparent a company should be, it doesn't stay siloed in um, how it's functioning within society in terms of its the ethics of the company or yeah. the sustainability of the company. Um, consumers want to know where's the transparency in the price that I'm paying? So it's kind of um, an all-encompassing transparency that consumers are demanding from companies now, or more mm -hmm. so expecting from companies. So, Absolutely. It yeah. looks like we have one more here. Yeah, so, and then we might go to break after this, but we'll see. Okay, sure. So the last one um, is called Quantopian. And this is more just a little insight on the back end. So... Um, so previously, a lot of these algorithms for quantitative investment strategies were written by a group of mathematicians and statisticians. And, and so um, you had to have a degree and then you would get a job and then you, and then this would be your job is to is to write these algorithms. So okay, what Quantopian, right. oh, okay. yeah, so what Quantopian is doing, is they're opening this up and it's they want everyone and anyone who knows how to write algorithms or who is analytical to come forward um, and have a platform where they can write these algorithms and compete for actually cash like, prizes on who going, can... Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, Keep no, on. no. Uh, who can write the best algorithms for um, different um, different investments. There was a there was an organization that we spoke about last season that was doing this with proteins. They were asking oh. uh, students, uh, a chemistry students, to unravel certain proteins and work on certain genetic situations, even. Mm -hmm. And they were offering prizes, and they were kind of going Fiverr with it. That company where you almost okay. kind of auditioned to be the best or whatever. Maybe you're taken, maybe you're not. Yep. 
Um, it sounds like this is a similar uh, strategy. Right. Um, and I, th I think this is great. It, it really increases the creativity and the types of, you know, you don't necessarily have to be in the field to be good at coming up with a good algorithm. Um, say you're just very analytical and you just never got into the financial, um, you know, you didn't take the traditional path to have that job, but you are very mm -hmm. analytical and you do know systems very well. And so their, their entire website kind of has this very open source feel to it. And even on a couple pages of their website, they have this leaderboard which is, oh my which is really fun. And so everyone has their own online profile and they track who um, has the best algorithm for that week or for, for that month and, um, and then who won which cash prizes. So every week they're giving out cash prizes. And so they're really getting people excited about writing really great investment algorithms. Leveling Wall Street's playing field, it says mm -hmm. here on their homepage. You said that and I went right to the link right on air here because I was curious about that you yeah. know and it's interesting because does that create some horrible competitive environment or does it create an environment where people are celebrating together i'm not sure yeah i mean i think even if it is competitive it's competitive to create better algorithms so in the end the consumer wins yeah fair enough mm -hmm. that's cool yeah. well i do think we've been talking for almost a half an hour here i think we will okay. cut to break Sounds quickly good. And uh, when we come back, I think we're going to discuss kind of the pros and cons of um, the, some of these algorithms. We've already hinted at some of that mm -hmm. a little bit, but I see that you have almost a half page of notes here about the said pros and cons. <laughs> sure. So I'll be very excited to dig into that when we come back. Okay. Leona, thank you. I'll see you in about a minute and a half. Okay, sounds good. For you, ready to assist you if you care to take a test and split those loans, then you'll know to let it grow and it can be all right. I'll be right here saying that you should invest. Yeah, you should invest now. Put your assets in a folder I'm ready Still thinking that you maybe Might need to choose I can discover trends for you Recommend portfolios And you'll just know that you should invest yeah, and we could invest now, you're getting bolder, and I'll build a base for you. You should invest now, cause I invested in you. From TPN at technophilespodcast.com, I'm David Geisler, and this is the Technophiles Podcast. Hey, everybody, we are back from the break. I am David Geisler, your host, here with my co host, Leona Liu, and we are discussing finances in the modern age. Yeah, that's not exactly <laughs> the title. We're actually kind of talking about ro robots dealing, dealing, dealing with the dollars. Robots dealing with the dollars. That should have been the title, I think. Making millions. Making mil two executions of alliteration. That's it. We're mm -hmm. done. We're set. That's two books right there. That's two self help books. We're done. Let's just stop this and get on those books. <laughs> That's how you make the millions. Um, let's see here. So we just got done talking about all these different companies that are trying to distribute robo advisors in different ways, slightly mm -hmm. different ways, yep. perhaps, or at least tweak the algorithms in different ways. So what are, in your, in your opinion, we've kind of discussed some of the pros just by celebrating these things in the first act. Yep. Let's get dirty and cut right to some of the, 
some of the scary stuff. What's what are some of the potential cons, even if they're not that scary? Okay. Um, well, <laughs> some, some of the I want I want scary cities burning. Things. We need we need the headlines. I need to shack and all. We need to do the ten o'clock nightly <laughs> news thing here, and everything has to be horrible. They're gonna right, come so into good? your home, mm-hmm. and they're going. Mm-hmm. No, I'm just kidding. Your dishwasher um, will kill you tonight. They're gonna talk to the robo advisor. He's going to advise mm. them to. Well, once Flood we have our, yeah, place. once we have our, <laughs> once like the home pods and the Alexas are all controlling the house, right. Robo advisor will know. Then the cobot's going to come in and say, I will push you. And then all of a sudden it's this whole season situation. They're going to analyze but, your home insurance. And then oh. the robo advisor is going to advise the washing machine to flood the house at an optimal it. time to where you can collect on the home in- insurance. <laughs> I think you're onto something. I think I think that's that's exactly how you exploit that situation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or furthermore, furthermore, it's going to be like, um, "Hey Siri, uh, please order more." Or Alexa, order more bananas. And then Alexa's like, "Are you sure you can afford that?" <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know. I guess not. <laughs> Okay, anyway, okay. I, you know, I'm, we're joking so, around, but um, right, yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess one of the I wouldn't say it's so so much as a very scary thing, but um, robo advisors versus a traditional advisor, um, it will probably most likely a robo advisor will will almost always encourage you to save your money, um, okay. and it may miss other factors such as. Um, credit card debt or student loans. It may not, um, because these companies, their goal is try to sell you these investment packages or these investment strategies. So is it in their benefit for you to do all these other things first and delay um, you purchasing their products? It's sometimes there's a little gray area um, and that's where the the human or the, the consumer really has to step in mm. and make that decision um, yeah because it's a bit like um the self it's a bit like self-driving cars uh the technology behind self-driving cars right. of course they have to be conservative um because you can't drive like a crazy person you know but a human might really yes. get excited about driving their sports car recklessly and all that but the the uh the robot's gonna reel it in because it's that is the better choice b- compared to driving a car off a cliff or something like that is this similar this sounds exactly the same, frankly. Right. Um, and so I think there still needs to be some sort of human element. We're not at a place where you can allow these algorithms or these robo-advisors to make 100% of your financial decisions for you. Mm-hmm. Um, they're more Maybe of, lay a base right. and then you can make the, the creative choices or whatever. Right. They're more of suggestions, um, recommendations on paths that you could go down. Um, so... Not so much scary as just a, you know, I don't think we're there yet in terms of giving up full control. Sure. But maybe one day. It, and should we one day? Is that one of the pros? Is that is that the idea? Um, I think one day, because personally, I like to automate all of my financial um basically everything I have in terms of finances, what, whatever I can automate, I will automate. Yeah. So in terms so, of something as simple as paying a bill yes. all the way up to an investment. Yes. Uh, paying a okay. bill, um, an investment. I, I kind of lay out a plan on my own. Mm. Um, I do use some robo advisors in terms of the recommendations, but in terms of automating tasks, what I can automate, I try to, and maybe, sure. f- maybe five, maybe three years, maybe five years down the road, what I feel comfortable handing over to an algorithm will change. Um, and also that algorithm could change the same way that Alex and I were discussing smart homes and how they'll create uh, personality profiles based on the patterns that you exhibit mm-hmm. by wanting to cook toast at the t- same time every day or taking showers at certain temperatures. Right. Perhaps these algorithms could do similar observations on the investments. Right. Um, and so there is one uh, one company that is moving towards a more interactive type of robo investor. So the previous cool. ones that we talked about, um, they're more, they're not conversational. 
in in terms of interacting with the robo advisors it's a, it's a very um it's a survey that you like fill in all your information and then the algorithm does its job and then it it outputs um its output is like a b c d e these are your selections right okay all right um so this company clink is actually trying to make it more conversational and take over the role of a financial advisor so it it interacts with your home pod and um is it oh so it is aesthetically trying to kind of feel like a person yes and i i think you had done an episode on the home pod with alex a few yeah, yeah that was episodes i think back yeah, pardon me three or four episodes ago right. yes absolutely um, i apologize so so clink is actually they have a video on their website and what they do is um it has a video of this guy washing dishes and and he's like Oh, hey, I'm thinking of spending $200 at Whole Foods. Do I have the budget to do that? And <gasps> so... What? It is the joke about, I want bananas Amazon. Yes, I don't it know is. That's why I didn't say anything. Because I was like, oh we're going to get to it. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, can please, I? Please, please. And then, um, and then you would ask, do I have it in my budget? And then they would say... Um, according to the algorithms that they already have for your long-term and short-term goals, they would say something like, well, for this month, maybe cut it down to 150. Hmm. And they'd be like, okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Or the ideal, um, I think what they're trying to move towards is, say you go to Starbucks and you spend $5 on a macchiato a mocha I'd, frappuccino yeah mocha frappuccino okay and with and then and some chocolate and then with extra sprinkles so mm-hmm. it's a five dollar or seven dollar i don't know how much they are now yeah. um let's say they're seven dollars let's say they're seven dollars and then so you have one at let's say 8 a.m mm-hmm. and then you're really crazy about this and you have another one at a uh 12 30. And wow. then you have another one at four. So maybe by the by the third, what are we ordering? A caramel macchiato? Whoa. I don't know. Yeah. Mocha frappuccino with <laughs> sprinkles on top. With, fra- with sprinkles. So Amazon maybe by the is third like, one. <laughs> at that point, at that point, health kit kicks in. Yeah. It's not even finances. Health kit's just like, this is too much sugar. We're you got to cut off. this yeah. out. Um, you're going to have a heart attack. We're freezing your account. You're not able to spend <laughs> at here. Yeah. So... So ideally, what happens is by the third purchase, say you go to the coffee shop three times, by the third purchase, it will give you a little question like, hey, do you really need that third coffee? Sure. So it's kind of like a little a guidance, a financial mm-hmm. guidance um, mm-hmm. in, and, and, in terms and of tracking me, your purchases. Why would it say that on the third one? We know why in general, but are there some days, Is it would it say that because it's just in general trying to help you spend a little less? I think, um, so I don't know the entire back end, but my, what I would guess is that mm-hmm. it would categorize coffee as a non-essential. So like right. groceries, maybe not, but maybe like eating at a restaurant or going out for entertainment or um, purchases on like movie tickets, something like that. It would put it as like an entertainment or extra category. And so it would trigger. Mm -hmm. I've personally used mint for the last couple of years, Mm -hmm. just as a real base general kind of budget type of thing. We we actually did an episode on mint like five or six years ago when it was just coming around and every single person on the show ended up using it because we kind of liked the idea. You had to be comfortable with offering your bank information over, but all things considered, it seemed pretty legit. Um, Nevertheless, there are times where you'll have like literally your, your movie budget or your entertainment budget. And every once in a while, I'll get a message that says like, hey, you actually have a little extra cash in your blah, blah, blah budget. If you want to go see a movie, go for it. Oh. Or, or the reverse or the reverse. Huh, OK, so I think in in terms of these types of apps, these robo advisors, they would say, hey, you have a little extra in your budget. Let's invest it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Let's right. purchase I, I one of our products. That's that's mm-hmm. what they would say. And so maybe mint, maybe mint is just trying to sell happiness or something. I don't. Know. I don't want to get into it too much. It's <laughs> but you know, it's a different. It's a different product. I think. Right, it's a different product. Um, and I think they might be changing in terms of their financial services or products that they're offering. Um, but I I don't know too much about that. Um, Got it. And. 
So one thing that I thought was interesting about Clink, and in addition to the, the episode that you had with Alex on the HomePod, right. was you guys had mentioned something about all of these home assistants having like a female voice. So I think well, you briefly so touched on it. There was an issue that Alexa, Alexa is a female voice. Mm-hmm. Siri by default is female. Right. Google Home might also be female. I don't. I can't recall. I think I have memories of both. Siri has three male voices and three female voices, mm-hmm. but the default is female. Right. And um, uh, there was a cu- there were a couple organizations that we spoke about that had an issue that took issue with that 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 was the default. Okay. And um, and I can kind of understand that a little bit. Yeah. So I thought. Yeah, I can understand. Um, so the implications. The implications. Yes. Um, so. When I was watching this video of this interaction with Clank the Service, pardon the me, audio, please tell me it was like a burly man that was like, "You better save money." Unfortunately, like it was of, not a burly man. Uh, um, I was just thinking, what's the most but, opposite of like <laughs> a kind Siri voice? I don't know. We could do an episode on it. <laughs> I apologize. I'll let you tell your story. I was sure. just trying to guess ahead of time. Um, so while I was watching this video, it actually did have a female voice. Um, and did it have an accent? There's actually, yeah, uh, it did. Was it not, British or Australian? I don't believe it had an accent. That's a step in the right direction. So there, so there was this study done by MIT when they were doing um, a driverless car uh, interface that they found that that users found a female voice or a female like an overall female feel in terms of design to be more trusting and consumers were more forgiving when it messed up so when we spoke about the this in the homepod episode the organization that took issue with the female voice they felt that it was implying that that we were training ourselves that a female voice should be subservient and you're asking siri and alexa to do all these things Um, but it's also true there's I think it's just kind of factual that, yeah, a, a, a soft-spoken female voice is going to be a little bit more relaxing to anyone right. compared to a, a burly male voice, for example. <laughs> it's got to be burly, you know, though. A drill sergeant, right? <laughs> you know, a, Nobody wants a drill sergeant telling them what to do as far as investing or driving or otherwise. Right, right. Um, so I just thought that was really interesting just because hmm. I, I had heard you guys had kind of briefly touched on that on your uh, HomePod episode. Fair enough. I'm starting so. to wonder when there's going to be a finance kit. Like we have a health kit and a home kit in iOS mm-hmm. to help, you know, home kit helps all the smart devices talk. Mm-hmm. Health kit helps all the health devices talk. I wonder if eventually we'll start seeing something like a finance kit through Google, Amazon or Apple. I'm, I'm sure just, they're working on it. Um, yeah. And the th- and the thing is, so I just saw in the news today that Amazon is working with JP Morgan to offer bank accounts to its customers. And... It doesn't seem that okay. far off because they already have a credit card, which a lot of companies yeah, do. But one thing that I was reading is that consumers who are entering this space or want to try a new financial product are going to do it with a with a tech company or willing to do it with a tech company they already trust. And con- as a consumer, I think a lot of us trust Amazon to put out... Um, the best product that they can in terms of thinking about the consumer's needs. We already trust them in terms of providing a lot of reviews. I mean, even if we're not buying the product on Amazon, we go to Amazon because we trust the validity of the reviews on Amazon. That's an excellent point. That's an Um, excellent point. And they... That's not Amazon. That's often not Amazon making those reviews, but they are providing the service to allow others. We're going there as a database. Yes. And I buy tons of things on Amazon. There's nothing wrong with that. Yes. But I feel like the messaging with Amazon isn't necessarily the best product, but it is definitely usually the cheapest. It's the cheapest and um, they provide good value. So as a consumer, just personally, I would trust mm-hmm. I would trust Amazon with providing a more robust financial service over JP Morgan. So perhaps, I don't know much about J.P. Morgan, and I do support Amazon, and I'm a customer, mm-hmm. and I use Amazon, but Amazon's, if you know, sometimes people kind of harp on Apple or Google about vertical integration. Mm-hmm. 
Amazon is actually, in my opinion, the most aggressive yes. vertical vertical integration company in existence. Their, yes, their whole business plan for a decade or two was to just lose money hand and fist to get users. Because once you have users, then you have them, you know, you have their blood, you have them in your system. And yes. Amazon knew that that was more important than anything else. Mm -hmm. Apple does it by only making the products work with each other. Right. Google does it by trying to pretend that they're not caring, but they actually care a lot. <laughs> right. And Amazon just does it because they offer this this service. Right. So I don't know. I, w I am not reluctant to have Amazon be my bank, but I would kind of feel like, oh my gosh, you already have so much of my life. Mm -hmm. Am I even, am I giving it all away then if it's a bank? And I'm just offering that in this conversation. Yeah, that's, uh, that's something interesting to think about, I guess. Um, but you're, you're I, owning you're owning what I'm buying and you're owning the stuff I'm buying it with. This seems a little yes. um, cannibalistic or monopolistic or something. Yes. But, but 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 maybe I don't know what I'm talking about, but it does feel that way a little. It It is a little bit of that. But if Amazon was if they were to offer a financial product such as an investment package or a robo advisor, I would be willing to try it out with Amazon. OK, interesting. Um, yeah, fair enough. Mm hmm. Amazon's entire goal is to just sell more things. Right. And do, would you be worried about that advisor having an agenda? Well, so that that is something that we need to be wary of is how much do we trust technology and how much do we trust these companies in terms of um, how much do we outsource our decision making to these companies? And yeah. are they really recommending the best selection of products or are they skewing maybe and this probably would happen, is they're skewing their products or recommending right. their products over another company's. For example, Amazon has famously um, downsold Apple products and stuff on their website right. and even not, not even even not carried certain things. Mm -hmm. um, I can think about Google ads. I don't want to just pick on Amazon or Apple or whatever, but like right. Google ads um, had a situation where Let's call this gossip because I don't have a source with me right now. Okay. Let's. I'll even say allegedly. I'll protect. Okay. What I'm speaking about because um, this is I didn't wasn't prepared for this, but um, okay. they had an issue with you know you get these ads on the side of your pages and and then all of a sudden um, you know Google search the search engine yeah. is different for every user. If 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 you and I right now were both to search dinosaur, we'd actually probably get different pages. Yes. Um, maybe, frankly, I'd probably get more pictures because I love looking at dinosaurs. Maybe you get a couple <laughs> more articles. I mean, I'm just joking right now, but I'm just trying to say, okay. or like based on our GPS where we are, the pages would be different. Right. What can happen is you can sell that preference as an ad. Yes. It's a it's a soft ad and you can you can for a, for a price an algorithm can be swayed mm -hmm. more towards product XYZ or company XYZ and that can happen hopefully it wouldn't but it can happen without the user even knowing. Right. And I think they did so get th in trouble a few years back um, for skewing the search results. Mhm. Mm Mm -hmm. It's true. Mm -hmm. It's true. So um, I actually think robo advisors are fantastic, and this is so true with everything that mm -hmm. has to do with technology and the time that we live in. Right. It really is about the human condition. Which way will it go? It probably will go a little bit, a little bit, right, for the better. Um, but it is something to be aware of as we move forward. Would right. you agree? Yeah, um, because these are companies; they are in it for a profit. So we have to be wary of what is their commercial agenda. Mm -hmm. It's. They're oh, selling oh, I just it. realized that is not to say that a classic bank does not have a commercial agenda. Right. They one hundred percent do. Yes, I'm not trying to offer the the opposite. Right? No, they definitely do. Um, but in terms of which products these robo advisors are recommending, yeah. um, I think as a consumer, you still need to do a little vetting before you yeah. hand everything in terms I of agree. decision making over to these robo advisors. So what happens here? Are there even banks anymore? I mean, are people just like talking to computers on their phones? Where does this go? Um, I think that the future of fintech is that you can do almost everything on your phone, from your computer, that I don't know about, how, I don't know how long physical banks are going to be you know, be on every corner or be, right. you know, in every town. I don't remember the last time I actually stepped into a bank. 
I can speak to that personally. I、uh, I am with a credit union,、okay. and over the last eight years, I have I've I've lived in three different cities now in the last eight years,、mm-hmm. and、um, in all of those cities, this credit union is is near. So I've experienced many different branches, I guess you could say,、okay. over the years. Because it's true, I don't quote unquote you know step into a bank often either.、Mm-hmm. However, over the course of the last eight years. Every single one of these branches that I experienced, with the exception of one that I can think of right now, so that is five out of six,、mm-hmm. were replaced with screens、yep. and essentially just like ATM machines. Yes. And a few of them have the thing where it's someone sitting in an office and they the this monitor comes up and you're still speaking to a human, but、mm-hmm. they all they need to do is employ ten people to service you know a hundred locations because all one hundred aren't being used at the same time. Right. It's kind of like the model, like that Microsoft Word had back in the '80s, when you'd only sell so many licenses, but everybody could download Word, but only so many could run.、Mm-hmm. But but that's not exactly what I'm trying to talk about. So yes, the the dissolving of the human experience inside a bank is front and center. I I, I feel right, and you know personally, when I walk in, when I do walk into a bank and I need to、um, withdraw cash for. You know, whatever reason,、mm-hmm. and say there is this very interactive ATM with this large screen, and there's a person at the there's a teller. I would prefer to to go to the interactive ATM. I say, I don't. I was about to say the same. I would prefer it,、um, and I choose it almost a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. Even if I mean, there is a line, <laughs> I would. So I. I would oh, even if there's a line,、yeah. perhaps I would trend towards the human then. And、I love you know people are great. I'm not anti-social. I have no problem interfacing with a human.、Mm-hmm. But at the at the grocery store, at any store,、yes. if there's if I can do auto checkout, I always prefer it because you kind of you kind of feel like you can go a little faster, or you're、yes. minimizing the variables. All、right. the variables are in your control. You,、right. you know what I mean? And it's kind of this.、Um, we kind of touched on it in the beginning, where when you meet with a financial investor or a financial advisor, or when you meet with any type of Human in a selling space, there's going to be maybe fifteen twenty minutes or more of small talk. Of fluff, yeah, was, yeah, fluff, right? Yeah. So when you have these very complex algorithms where they can, you can just input everything you need, and then it gives you these recommendations, and you can be at home. You don't have to get ready for a two hour meeting or a one hour meeting. You can just、yeah. do it whenever it's convenient for you. I think that's where everything is kind of trending now. So, in terms of having, of,、yeah. no, go ahead. Please. Well, I was going to say I can't help but think about what's happening with um, um, many like fast food chains right now. All of these quick service, even even the slightly higher end fast food chains like、uh, Panera's and Qdoba's and whatever those ones that are just a little bit above like the really gross stuff,、um, <laughs> they're all trending towards. <laughs> Um, okay.、Uh, auto, auto. You know,、uh, per, you know, you you just go to a screen、right. and you make your order and then it comes in. And the reason this is is some of its efficiency,、mm-hmm. but the truth is people are more inclined to buy more food if they don't have the guilt of ordering that food in front of a person. Yes. So I wonder if we can spin that and offer that as a positive. In the investing, maybe you are a little more inclined to try something if you don't have to.、Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't want to sound like an idiot to this person and say, "Well,、right. could I invest in this or that?" Or I don't really know what I'm talking about. I'm just going to let them talk to me for 20 minutes, and I'm just going to say yes to whatever they say, and I really still don't know what's going on. Maybe, and I'm, I'm, I'm definitely spinning、point. this. I'm trying here. I'm kind of working at this one, but <laughs>、okay. maybe that's a positive with with this experience. I think it's definitely a positive.、Um, it is a little intimidating to meet with someone face to face and、um, admit all of the things that. Maybe you don't know about or you don't understand. Whereas you can kind of, if you don't understand it when you're going through this process on these websites, you can just open up a new screen and Google it. <laughs> I mean, fair enough. Like, oh, I don't understand this term. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like, keep nodding my head and saying, okay, okay, okay. You know, you can just open、oh, up a true. screen. Oh, that's true. You can admit you don't know, right? And then just find it very quickly. Right. Just admit to yourself. You don't have to, you know, feel. It removes some of the performance,、mm-hmm, right? Yeah, interesting. So I think I mean think about that.、Mm-hmm. Yep. So、um, yeah, I don't know if there's going to be as many banks in the future.、Um, mm-hmm. I mean, they're I all. I mean, eventually, of- what we don't have banks, and then it's all robo advisors, and then all the robo advisors are so automatic with the money that we lose money, and then we're in Star Trek, and then it's Star Trek, and we've made it. <laughs> that we've made it. 
We've done it. <laughs> done. Global peace. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think that I think the ultimate goal is really to have all of your finances. You, you kind of have a, a digital passport, so it's an all-encompassing. You have all of your your mortgage, your car loans, your student loans, your uh, twenty-year financial goals, all all your spending habits, all in one area. And then you can move forward in terms of making decisions. Right now, it's still fairly segmented. Sure. So I think the the market and the space is moving towards that direction. Um, but to capture yeah. all of that data and to have someone to trust one company with all of that information is is still a little daunting, I think. But mm-hmm. uh, it's kind of like that genomi- genomics and uh, blockchain episode you guys did. About- oh, last week? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I can see the similarities. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Right. And, you know, actually going, I'm wondering now, for someone who's listening to this, if they're curious about any of the things we spoke about, and we kind of spoke to this, it does seem like we tend to end these episodes with this, what I'm about to speak about or what I'm about to offer. Okay. It is a little bit of, yeah, fine. We had some fun saying that we're going to live in Star Trek. We had some fun saying, no, the computers are going to take over. It's going to be horrible. <laughs> what, what, how does this really work going forward, you know, in the next five years? If someone wants to, is curious about using some of these services, what's, what is your take on all of that? I really think that in the end, even five years down the road, the ultimate um, goal or what I see is that the consumer wins. The consumer gets more information, more transparency. They get better products because all, a lot of companies, even like Amazon, who isn't in in this space, they're trying to get in this space. There's a lot of money to be made because there's all these new consumers, these untapped consumers that um, companies that are doing micro investing, doing robo advisors, they're trying to reach out to a larger consumer base who are currently not in the investment space right now. So I think um, with all of these competitions of trying to acquire customers, the consumer wins because they have more financial um, products um, to choose from. They, The fees are going to be lower because cust- or con- uh, the companies are going to be competing for the lowest fee because that's something that the customer now is able to see very clearly. Yeah. Yeah. And the consumer is able to have a greater interaction with their personal finances, so greater visibility on their personal finances. It's going to, um, in terms of design, I think, especially with apps, consumers want to stay with and interact with apps that are well designed. So that aspect as well is going to be beneficial for the consumer. So they're going to have better um, well-designed products, greater visibility, and they're going to be more involved in their finances moving forward. So I think it's a win-win for the consumer. Yeah, I think I, I think I also agree. Should it also sounds like, if I may speak for you, and you can correct me, mm-hmm. you're. I think it feels like you're encouraging people if they're curious about entering this space or starting to invest or something. It sounds like you're kind of saying this is the way to give it a try. Well, I think. Um, I think each person is different in terms of personal finances because it is is it it is personal, um, mm-hmm. but these are some new companies that are coming out to offer different options. So if you want to invest with your values, if you want to invest with um, uh, different uh, income levels, if you want to in, invest, or if you want to write code or write algorithms, you know, there's a lot of um, there's a lot more opportunity for people to enter the space now. So I, I think consumers right now, since it's still in the beginning, they still need to do their research um, and find what product is the best fit for them. But it, it is exciting. There's a lot of fun new things in the market now. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. It is it is quite cool. Well, Leon, I think we'll we'll end it there. This okay. was this was this was awesome. I enjoyed. Like I said, I was going to learn something tonight. I really. As we started, I was even thinking to myself, like, you know, I'm going to host this, but I'm not sure where we're going. And I'm so pleased. Yeah, so thank you very much. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. Indeed. Of course. Now, we have you scheduled um, to go again in, I think, four or five episodes mm-hmm. because now we have this thing where we're rotating through the cast members. Yep. And I can't wait. I think it's just going to be a blast. Yeah, I think so, too. Looking forward to it. Excellent. Uh, welcome to the show. And uh, hopefully you. we even pull in one or two more new people. And I think this is going to be a really well-rounded season. And I'm very excited about that. So, Leona, let's see. If people do want to learn a little bit more about this, I'll certainly put the links to some of these companies specifically, which we have no affiliation with, mm-hmm. in our show notes. Right. Um, 
Uh, let's see. They can also tweet us at Technophiles Pod. Is there anywhere you'd like them to find you or anything, or do you want to just kind of keep it with the show? Um, I think we can keep it with the show. You know, we'll we'll be involved in terms of the conversations, and it'll mm-hmm. it'll be uh, easier to maybe just streamline it into Technophiles Pod. Excellent. Yeah. I do know that you you see the tweets. Um, all of our cast members actually see the tweets yep. when they come in. So if people have certain uh, things that they want to ask, yeah, we'll jump will on the conversation. It. So. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, that's another. That's the thing that I automated. I've got. I have a little Twitter Slack that every time there's a tweet, it dumps it into our Slack so everyone can see it, and and hopefully that'll really be a benefit yeah. here. Yeah. Okay, Leona. Well, have a great night, and um, um, uh, yeah, let's see. Let me let me just promote the show a little bit further. If you're listening <laughs> to us on iTunes, remember that you can find us a video version of this show on YouTube. We're mm-hmm. also on Google Play. And uh, you can find uh, some more stuff about the show on our Facebook page and our Twitter account already. Mm-hmm. Yep. I mentioned that, which is Technophiles Pod. And we are also Technophiles Podcast on Instagram, where we kind of have some fun and throw in some behind the scenes photos and, and we just kind of keep it. That's a little, you know, when we first started the show, that was our Tumblr account was ah, kind of our behind Tumblr. the scenes thing. And then Tumblr trended and then it kind of went into his other space. Yep. And a lot of that stuff is executed on Instagram these days. And so now Instagram is kind of our behind the scenes experience. Yeah. And if you do check us out on YouTube, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Hey guys, hit like, subscribe. Like subscribe. Remember to hit that bell. <laughs> Remember to hit that bell. You can get notifications every time. Yes, please. And leave a review on iTunes because it's so important. Yep. It's, it's interesting. We have, we're in a weird place right now because this show has been going for 10 seasons mm-hmm. um, and iTunes is, and we're, it's the same XML feed. You know, if you, sometimes if you throw a new XML feed into iTunes, it gets into a new and notable. Mm-hmm. We, we are an old XML feed. I, I will confess we've been doing this show for a long time. Yep. So if anybody's listening to the show and they are inclined to ask us questions or to review the show, please do that it certainly helps us get pushed around a little bit more on the itunes store all right leona well have a great uh evening Thank and I'll, you. I'll see you on slack soon i'm sure i'll be excited to have this episode thanks come out. david take care all right bye now bye